Happy Sabbath, church family. The sun is just starting to peek out, and every time this week I go, oh, it's here. The next day, rain. Either being a Washingtonian or an Oregonian who loves sun, I wait for it all year long. I tried the California thing, and that doesn't really work for me. So I know I'd rather be here than in the sunshine, but if I can be here and in the sun, that's, that, that, that's home row right there. Growing up, I used to tell my mother, I said, what if God just made it rain every night really heavily? And then it could be sunny all day. We'd get all the evergreens, and God and I are still working that one out. If you want to join me, our passage this morning is in 1 Peter chapter 2, 11 through 12. It is page 1847, 1847 in the Bibles in front of you in the pew. And Peter has this to say to us. Dear friends, don't you love the way he starts that? It's not, well, you people, or uh, uh, those to whom I have to address or to whom it may concern. Dear friends, Peter says, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, or if you're not reading in the NIV, most passages would say desires of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives, in fact, Peter says, among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. And we love to do a thing as humans, particularly in church and in religious conversations and in conversations about God. We love to read, assume, sum it up really quickly, and go home. We love it if the pastor gets up on Sabbath morning and says, I've studied. I know what this passage means. I'm going to tell you simply what it means so you can know what it means. And then we can call it a week on being Christ followers and head home. The pastor feels good if the pastor can discover what the passage means, preach to you what it means, and then we can all go home. And it leads us into making a lot of assumptions about the text. We take a look and we go, it's really simple. Peter states it obviously for us. Let me summarize in Peter's words. Abstain from sinful desires. Boom. Preach a sermon, call it a day, it's over. Don't sin. Y'all got that? Anybody need to write it down? I'll put it in the community group handout in case you're struggling to grasp that. Don't sin, call it good. The problem is... That line of assumption where we don't ask questions of the text and we assume that our first read is exactly what the author intended leads us to do some serious injustice to the passage and to ourselves. It leads us down lines of logic that look like this. Abstain from desires of the flesh. Who desires the flesh. Sinful desires. Like drinking. I mean, I don't drink, but that's got to be a desire of the flesh. We probably should abstain from that or... Or uh, smoking. Well, I mean, I don't smoke, but that's probably a desire of the flesh, right? So we should probably abstain from smoking. Or promiscuity. I'm not sexually promiscuous, but, you know, that's, that makes sense as a really good desire of the flesh. Uh, debauchery. We, you know, tossing some really good King James language in there. Let's abstain from that. Oof, okay. That's good. Don't sin. Go home. The problem is it's just not that simple. In fact, that's not even what Peter is saying. As obvious as it seems, friends, I'm going to encourage you, oftentimes when Scripture seems like what it is saying is so obvious that everyone in the world is going to interpret it the same way, you're not reading carefully enough. Because I don't know about you, but I've never met two people that completely agree in every degree on anything. It doesn't matter what we're talking about. You're going to disagree with somebody. So if it seems so blatantly obvious, it's time to ask some questions of the text. 
if we go over to Galatians where Paul talks about desires of the flesh, flip with me to Galatians chapter 5, 1773, 1773 in your pew Bibles. Just before Paul talks about what the fruit of the Spirit is, Paul talks about the desires of the flesh. We obviously don't spend a lot of time in church quoting the desires of the flesh. We love the fruits of the Spirit. But Paul lists them in counter to each other to give us a sense of comparison. I'm going to start in verse 13. Galatians chapter 5, I'm reading in verse 13 out of the NIV this morning. Paul says this. You, my brothers and sisters... Again, don't you love it? These instructions are never coming from somebody to randos. The instructions in Scripture are never, well, I'm a Christian and I know how it is. And I see Bobo over there is not performing how I think Bob should. So I'm going to write Bob a letter. That's not how it goes. Right? We're not going to write it to somebody random. These are people that there is a relationship with already. And Paul says, you brothers and sisters were called to be free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh, he says. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. First of all, do you notice the comparison? Don't use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Paul's comparison is not, don't use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Don't indulge in the flesh. The opposite of indulging in the flesh is serving one another in love. Odd, but okay. 14. For the entire law, Paul says, is fulfilled in keeping this one command... Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. That's his warm-up. Paul's getting his juices going. Did a little stretch and now he's going for the home. Watch this. 16, Paul says this. So I say, walk by the Spirit. And, what does it say? You will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now, wait a second. Peter says, I encourage you, don't gratify the desires of the flesh. Don't do the sinful things. I want you to hold back. Abstain from sinful desires. And Paul says, you want to know how to do it? You walk in the Spirit. Well, now, this is not as simple as me picking a list of things that I'm going to choose not to do and not doing them. Walking in the Spirit is a very vague concept. I bet you if I went out through the audience today and I asked, what does walking in the Spirit mean? Everybody is going to give a different variation on what it means to walk in the Spirit. And I guarantee you, just with the people here this morning, some of y'all will be really uncomfortable with what some other people think walking in the Spirit looks like. You can go, well, clearly they haven't read Scripture enough. They need to do more abstaining from sinful desires. than But Paul says the answer to abstaining from sinful desires is walking in the Spirit. He says if you walk in the Spirit... And friends, the Greek sets this up as a promise. It's like a guarantee. If you walk in the Spirit, I guarantee you, you will abstain from sinful desires. If this is your mode of operation, you are spirit-driven and spirit-focused. Your behavior will follow, I promise you. Oh, and he's just getting warmed up. Y'all watch this. For those of you who think we're really comfortable with what the desires of the flesh are and they look like something somebody else does. Oh, Paul's got a thing to say. 17, I'm going to keep reading. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. What you naturally want to do isn't what the spirit naturally wants to do. They usually are going to go against each other. They're in conflict with each other, he said, so that you are not to do whatever you want to do. Y'all, Paul is the biggest grace preacher in Scripture. And he's really clear, grace doesn't mean you just go do whatever the heck you feel like doing. That's not what it is, he says. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Well, now it's confusing. He says you're not supposed to do whatever you do. Also, the law doesn't matter. Hang with me. The acts of the flesh, Paul says, are obvious. And by obvious, he means you don't have to go read the law of Moses to figure out that these aren't things that you want to do. Sexual immorality, comfortable with that one. 
Impurity, not a problem. Debauchery, okay. Idolatry, we don't really do that. Not, not a big deal. Witchcraft, okay. I don't think we have any witches in here this morning. It's probably my guess. If we do, we're glad you're here. <laughs> then he gets uncomfortable. Hatred. Anybody got somebody you really, really dislike? For any reason? Religious or otherwise? Because hatred is an act of the flesh. It's a sinful desire. Discord. Okay, maybe you don't hate somebody, but I guarantee, as much as I am a human standing on the platform this morning, I guarantee you're at discord with somebody. Y'all, that's a desire of the flesh. Jealousy. I love this. The NIV puts the fits of rage. When you get really upset and it bubbles just slightly beyond control. Anybody resonating with any of these yet? Because they're ticking right down my list. Selfish ambition. Dissension. Is a desire of the flesh. It is a sinful desire to be dissenting and he follows it with factions. Yeah, well, we over here follow what God wants us to do. And we disagree with what they do. Y'all, that division is a desire of the flesh. If you're going to put yourself in one camp and disagree with the other camp over here, thus making a split, you're in the wrong. The moment we divide you from me based on what I think and what you think, we are gratifying desires of the flesh. Is this a more uncomfortable list for anyone? I don't get to pick the big hitters that I don't struggle with. I've got to pick all of the things that it is to be human. Because Peter and Paul say the spirit and the flesh are at war. That's not just a bad habit that you don't want to have. That is your identity as a person is in conflict with your identity as a spirit follower. Are you with me this morning? And envy and drunkenness and orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before. And then Paul brings down the sledgehammer. That those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you are divided this morning, you will not inherit. That's all of us. If you are dissenting this morning, you do not inherit. That's all of us. If you are jealous this morning, you do not inherit. The, that's all of us. What are we going to do with this? The sinful desires that wage war against the soul are the very things that it is to be human. They're broken. And if you came to church this morning feeling less broken than someone else, I got news for you, friend. The lack of self-awareness is as broken as whatever the obvious thing that you're looking at in somebody else is. You are as or more broken than the people you're sitting around. And you don't inherit the kingdom. Ah, but that's where the good news comes. <laughs> Y'all, the passage isn't about sinful desires. Neither Paul's passage nor Peter's passage is actually about a list of sinful desires. Notice, Paul's going to go on in just a moment and talk about the movements of the flesh, the, the, the fruits of the spirit. He's going to say, here's what it looks like to be spirit-filled, love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness. It's not even about that. What is it about then? I got to take you back to last week where Jim preached. The, the two verses before this. The conversation here is not about a list of behaviors. It is about your identity. It is not about a list of things that you do or don't do. The conversation being had in both Peter and Paul is about who you are. Listen to this. But you are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. 
a holy nation. You are God's special people that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not even a people, but now you are a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you had received mercy. Dear friends, Peter says at the beginning, I urge you as foreigners, as exiles, as strangers. That's the point of the passage. We read and we see abstain from sinful desires and we go, good, I can do that. Here's my list and I won't do that. That's not the point. Peter says the point is that your identity is one who doesn't belong here. Your identity is as one who is already sold out to the kingdom of heaven, which is, friends, at hand now. And the methodology of living that life is being obsessed with the spirit Do you want to abstain from sinful desires? Be obsessed with the Spirit. Peter and Paul make it look like we're making an argument between law and grace. Got to not do the bad things. No, 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 no. Paul, you got grace. Live in freedom. No, 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 no. They both say no. It's not about law versus grace. It's a whole different conversation. It's not about what you do. It's not about law versus grace. It's about how you think. It's about how you process. The move is not behavioral. Peter says, I want you to think differently because you are a holy nation. It's not about what you do. It's about who you are. Do you hear me this morning? It's not about what you do. It's about who you are, and you cannot change your identity. The only entity that can change who you are is the Spirit. It's not about what you do. It's about who you are. Friends, if we managed somehow to go down the list that Paul makes for us and to do what Peter, it, we think Peter is saying, and we managed to abstain from all the sinful desires... And we haven't been transformed by the Spirit, people will see straight through you. My hunch is you all have interacted with people in church who don't smoke, and they're mean. My hunch is you've interacted with people who are really, really good at only being intimate with their spouse, and you would never, ever want to have the marriage they have. Friends, it is not about abstaining from sinful desires because we can do that and miss the whole point. People will see straight through you if your focus is on how you behave. But y'all, if we flip this on its head as Peter and Paul are calling us to, and our focus is on who we are and allowing the Spirit to transform our identities from people who live here to people who already live in the kingdom. Your behavior is going to change. And when your behavior changes, on the day when God comes, Peter says, people are going to look back and go, praise the Lord. Something was going on there that we didn't even know about. Something was happening behind that behavior change. Friends, it is not about what you do. It's about who you are. When we pursue the Spirit, automatically, Paul says, you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. If you want to fix the flesh problem, chase the Spirit. What does that look like in Journey Church? Friends, community groups. To sit here and listen to Jim or I preach on a Sabbath morning isn't it this isn't christianity this is a celebration and we're thrilled to do this and we're glad you're here we want you here every week but the real stuff is happening in community groups in the week where we get open scripture and we say how do i chase the spirit if you have no idea this morning hallelujah because jesus wants to convert you friends Conversion is not about sitting here. Conversion is about chasing the Spirit. And it's not obvious. 
when you read the passage, you go, that's what it says. That's not it. There's something so much bigger going on. Peter says, let your life be transformed by the fact that you are chasing after the Spirit of God because the Spirit is going to do something in you that you are incapable of doing on your own. It's not about what we do. It's about who we are. It is not about a list of behaviors to not do. It is about changing our identity and frantically pursuing a God who will do things that will surprise you. Friends, if you're not in a community group, i got to encourage you again this morning. We're going to keep on saying this from the front. Our job as pastors, we get paid to pastor professionally. Y'all are pastors. We believe in the priesthood of all believers. There's no difference between you and us. We happen to have taken a little bit of education. But our job as leaders in this church is to encourage you to chase the Spirit. To find out when the Spirit agrees or when it disagrees with us. Friends, chase the Spirit. Let the Spirit begin to do its transformative work in you. Find a community group. If you don't have one that you are interested in joining, start a community group. Get together outside of church. And let's chase the Spirit. Let's realize that Peter is calling us not to a list of things not to do. Peter is calling you to a new identity. Peter's calling you to be an exile and a foreigner and a wayfaring stranger because the Spirit is changing your life. Friends, this week, the encouragement from Peter is go home and abstain from sinful desires. What does that mean? Go home and look for the Spirit. One more time, if you aren't in a community group, we're going to put the slides up again after church. They will be on the slides. You can see Come talk to Jim. Come talk to myself. Let us get you in a community group so you can pursue the Spirit because the Spirit wants to transform your identity from who you are now to a citizen of heaven. Friends, in this week, the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. Be gracious to you and give you peace until we meet again. Amen.